Um, good morning, everyone. This is um, a breakout session on CVAs. Um, just by way of a very quick uh, introduction, um, you'll notice that there are no slides on screen and there won't be during this talk. Um, so it's just us. Um, the idea is that this is as interactive as we can make it. Uh, and that's why we don't want you simply staring at our slides as entertaining as they might have been for the next 40 minutes. Um, a quick introduction. So um, uh, my name is Matthew Weaver. I'm co-hosting with Kate Rogers. Um, plenty of you I know will know us, but some of you won't. Um, Kate was called in 2009. Um, Chambers UK Bar 2021 describes her as very strong technically, helpful, down to earth, approachable and professional. So the full package there. Um, I'm uh, Matthew Weaver. I was called in back in 2002. Um, I was uh, previously a commercial and insolvency barrister, but since March this year, I've become a part-time school teacher, home office IT expert, and uh, hobby epidemiologist and virologist. Uh, those aren't recognised by Chambers UK Bar. However, Chambers UK Bar referred to me this year round as an insolvency heavyweight. Uh, presumably that was pre-COVID because I have lost a little bit of weight over the lockdown, so I'm more cruiserweight or super middle at the moment, but I'll take it. Um, very briefly, this is not a law lecture, you'll be glad to know. This is not intended to be a lecture uh, on the intricacies of challenges to CVAs. This is going to be as interactive as we can make it. Um, we want to set the scene on CVAs and highlight some of the changes that have occurred in the recent 12 months or so and have a little look to the future and what it may hold for CVAs. Um, please feel free to ask questions. Um, you can use the question and answer function within Zoom. Uh, we will uh, look at those questions. We will try and answer as many as we can during the talk and certainly at the end. Um, I should point out that those of you that know me as a proud Welshman, if any question is raised as to how many points England will beat Wales by this weekend, your question will be deleted and I will personally eject you from the Zoom. But other than that, you're free to ask whatever occurs. Um, we will cover the CBA position up to last year, beginning of this, so essentially where we were after Debenhams, the developments this year, and then what the future might hold. So can I start with um, where we were at the beginning of this year, end of last? And it was really the um, aftershot of Debenhams. So um, CVAs were becoming higher profile. They have done for a number of years now. Um, retail CVAs in particular are hitting the headlines much more so than they ever used to. And I think it's fair to describe landlords' attitude to those sorts of CVAs as disgruntled or unhappy. I think there may be other companies that would describe them in harsher terms, but I think that's fair. Um, a quick history lesson. CVAs were introduced for the first time by the 1986 Insolvency Act. Uh, they were a direct recommendation of the Court Committee in 1982. Uh, the Court Committee felt that the schemes of arrangement that existed under what was then the 1948 Companies Act were too cumbersome and too complex to protect creditors of insolvent companies. And this new procedure of a CVA was introduced uh, to be a convenient way to restructure debts without expense and complexity of the scheme of arrangement. Um, rather ironic in when one looks at the amount of costs incurred, certainly in the Debenhams challenge on its own, but that was the intention. Um, we all know, I think, and it's fairly well known that under section six of the act, uh, there is a challenge mechanism to CVAs. Um, either because the CVA or the terms of the CVA are unfairly prejudicial to creditors, members or contributories, or there has been a material irregularity in the meeting or the decision process. Um, cases up to Debenhams identified, amongst other things, useful methods for assessing whether a CVA is unfairly prejudicial. You had the vertical comparator, so comparing the outcome of the CVA with the outcome of a realistic alternative insolvency process, be that liquidation, administration. Uh, and that essentially created a, a floor below which the CVA couldn't fall below. So a CVA could not be less advantageous than what might be expected within a liquidation or administration. There's then also the horizontal comparator. So comparing the way in which some groups of creditors are treated compared to others. Worth noting, of course, as we know, differential treatment between creditors is not prohibited in CVAs, but it has to be justifiable. Um, so Debenhams, 
Uh, the Debenhams CBA uh, launched to address what the company described as unsustainable property costs. Uh, it introduced six categories of landlord. They were all treated differently from one another to certain extents in terms of the amount of rent paid and other provisions within uh, the agreement. It was challenged by a number of, of disgruntled landlords, um, with certainly with Mike Ashley and Sports Direct firmly in the background funding it and pushing the challenge. Um, the, challenge was on really five principal bases. Firstly, that landlords should not be considered creditors for future rent, and therefore future rent can't be compromised. Uh, that reducing rent is unfair automatically, uh, and uh, that a CVA in terms of changing the terms of leases is not allowable. Uh, thirdly, removing the rights of forfeiture interferes with a landlord's proprietary rights and outside the scope of a CVA. Fourthly, that landlords have been treated less favourably than other unsecured creditors without proper justification. Uh, and the fifth basis was a failure to identify possible voidable transactions under 239 and 245 within the uh, proposals. Uh, Mr Justice Norris considered, um, amongst other things, the intention of Parliament when creating CVAs and previous case law uh, and provided a, a decision on all of those grounds, which uh, in my view is a helpful ground uh, work and a helpful starting point for all CVA challenges from this point onwards. Um, in terms of whether future rent uh, is provable or indeed is um, within the scope of a CVA, um, it, he described the nature of the debt in a CVA as being exactly the same as the nature of a debt within any other formal insolvency process. So the definitions within the Act and the rules that, that apply to other insolvency processes apply just as much to CVAs. A debt must be pecuniary in nature, Mr Justice Norris said, uh, so money or money's worth for it to fall within the scope of a CVA. Um, a creditor includes someone who, to whom the company has a present obligation, which will in future become payable as a debt, either because of passage of time or on a contingency basis. And whilst future rent uh, as a contingent liability is not provable in liquidations, Mr Justice Norris drew a distinction between whether a debt is provable, which is something he didn't need to concern himself with here, or whether it is a debt to which a CVA can apply. And whilst ultimately he concluded, it may not be that future rent is strictly speaking a debt, it is at the very least a pecuniary liability to which the company may in the future become subject and as such CVAs uh, are entirely appropriate to alter and amend the terms of that and therefore reduce and compromise future rent. Uh, now that uh, clearly is an important provision because with all the common modern retail CVAs that is one of the premises of launching it to try and reduce future rent obligations and make them more affordable for the business. So a positive outcome for uh, property owning businesses, less so perhaps for landlords there. Um, Mr Justice Norris then had to consider an argument that reducing rent was automatically unfair. And the argument that was advanced was that a company makes use of the premises that it has to, uh, that it occupies for its business within a CVA, therefore it ought to pay full contractual rent in the same way as it does in liquidations and administrations, so applying the Lundy Granite principle. Um, however, Mr Justice Norris pointed out, helpfully I think, that that's true in liquidations of course, but CVAs were brought in to provide more flexibility and as an alternative to other formal insolvency processes. And so he concluded that reducing rent fell within the scope of an arrangement uh, and that there was no, um, no issue with doing that. Now, it's right to say that in this instance, there was no evidence before him that any of the reductions by the CVA took rent below market rate. Indeed, the evidence that was uncontested was that it did not fall below market rent. And therefore, fundamentally, there was nothing unfair in reducing that rent. Worth observing, of course, that if rent were to be taken below market rate, although Mr Justice Norris wasn't explicit, I suspect it may be a more difficult argument to argue that that's, up, that's fair within the context of a CVA. But he concluded nothing fundamentally unfair in um, reducing rent. Um, it is uh, fair in the fact specific of this case, which will always be the case. Um, and in this case, 
tenants were able, uh, sorry, landlords were able to terminate clauses in leases if they weren't satisfied with the new level of rent. And so they had a quid pro quo, which made it fair. Um, he also uh, importantly pointed out that new obligations weren't being created by reducing this rent. It was simply varying the existing agreements, which was the whole purpose of a CVA. Perhaps the most important decision um, for retail CVAs that Mr. Justice Norris made was as to forfeiture provisions. Um, his uh, determination was that whilst CVAs compromise and bind creditors, it does so in their character as creditors. It does not bind their proprietary rights or compromise their proprietary rights in any way. Um, he concluded that the right of re-entry that landlords have under a lease is not security, but it is property that belongs to the landlord. It is not simply a contractual entitlement. And therefore, whilst a CVA can modify pecuniary obligations, it cannot modify proprietary rights and therefore forfeiture provisions cannot be excluded. Right of re-entry cannot be excluded by a CVA. Now that's obviously uh, important because part of the um, rationale in the past for retail CVAs was to try and uh, ensure that possession was maintained of um, uh, of landlords' properties where it was in the interest of the company to do so. This obviously takes away that uh, ability to remove that power from landlords and so will have an effect going forward. Um, the fourth issue that Norris J had to deal with is whether landlords were treated less favourably than other creditors. In particular, the point was made that suppliers, unsecured creditors, suppliers were not affected by the CVA. Um, they were paid in full, whereas landlords had their liabilities, uh, uh, their uh, debts reduced. Um, it was pointed out that some of these creditors were not even critical. So a mini cab firm wasn't considered critical, accountants weren't considered critical, and perhaps laughingly, uh, the landlords didn't consider that firms of solicitors were critical creditors. I can't imagine where they got that impression from. Um, what Mr Justice Norris said was, of course, um, whether you treat creditors unfavourably does not render it uh, materially uh, irregular or unjust as a matter of principle. As long as you can explain the rationale behind it, you're entitled to treat creditors differently. Um, the point here was that business continuity required suppliers to be paid on different terms to landlords. Uh, and Mr Justice Norris pointed out that whilst there may be individual creditors within the 1600 or so of creditors that were unaffected by these, and they may not be strictly speaking critical on an individual basis, the company was entitled to consider it in the round rather than having to pick and choose individual unsecured creditors. So it could take a view that non-landlord unsecured creditors were critical, landlord treated in a different way. They didn't have to pick and choose and there was a more rough and ready process which was entirely permissible. Um, finally, he, he um, didn't find that the failure to identify uh, transactions that were susceptible under 239 or 245 was a problem. That was very fact specific and is unlikely to give any great indication going forward on any other CVAs. Um, what was then um, helpful, I think, and interesting from Mr Justice Norris's decision was that the court has a discretion as to how to treat uh, the CVA once a provision has been found to be uh, unfairly prejudicial or there's been a material irregularity. Uh, he identified that there was nothing to compel a court to simply rip up a CVA simply because one part of it uh, didn't um, meet the requirements of being fair. Um, he identified what is the conventional severance provision within the CVA and took the view that justice was best done by deleting the offending provisions of the CVA, i.e. those that uh, remove the right of forfeiture, but declaring that the CVA as modified continues and was valid. Um, now that's a, a helpful decision because it does remove the risk of the um, all or nothing argument that landlords um, try and run against CVAs, which is if it fails in one regard, the whole agreement should be ripped up. Um, in the Debenhams case, it's right to point out that there were some very obvious and very real practical difficulties in removing the forfeiture provisions out of the CVA and still making it work. Um, and I think it's worth 
thinking in the future about how that will work as a practicality. Can you simply remove offending provisions from a CVA and does the CVA still work and carry out what it was intended to do if you do that? I mean, it, it occurs to me just as a matter of principle that the bargain that you enter into in a CVA between company and creditor has give and take on both sides. If a court determines that one of the matters that you take away from a creditor, in this case, the right of forfeiture, has to be given back, are you changing the underlying bargain? And therefore, does it make sense to keep the CVA alive? Um, it's something that uh, companies will have to think about, I think, when they're drafting CVAs, that there is a reality that certain provisions might be removed, but the CVA might be declared to continue as a valid arrangement. Um, Debenhams uh, moved on in 2020 to a cost decision, which I won't spend a huge amount of time on. The only interesting point, I think, in the costs decision that uh, Mr Justice Norris, although he's retired, so Sir Alistair Norris now, he made a decision awarding the supervisors their costs of the challenge of the CVA in circumstances where they'd been joined to the application to challenge and there had been allegations that they'd been complicit in an attempt to reduce voting power um, within the allegations first made by the applicant landlords. Now the applicant landlords withdrew those allegations shortly before the trial um, but the supervisors were still represented at the trial and still had to engage in the issues. And Mr Justice Norris said, whilst um, the extent of the cost spent at trial may have to be reviewed by a cost judge uh, in circumstances where by the point of trial they knew that they were not in the firing line, the supervisor's costs of dealing with the challenge were to be payable by the unsuccessful applicant um, in circumstances where there was um, no real reason for joining them as parties. So a warning, I think, to landlords to some extent not to unnecessarily join supervisors to challenges. Um, very briefly, I just want to pick up on the nature of the way in which CVAs were being attacked at the end of last year, at the beginning of this. Um, yes, they were being un attacked under Section 6 of the Insolvency Act, as they always have been, for being unfairly prejudicial or materially irregular. Um, but the Debenhams decision highlighted additional areas of attack which have continued in, uh, to CVAs. So, um, Debenhams identified whether certain aspects of the CVA fell within the scope of an arrangement and therefore not simply was it unfairly prejudicial but could it form any part of an arrangement at all. So these attacks have continued into this year um, and certainly continue now in existing challenges as to whether the CVA is a genuine arrangement and the upshot of that challenge of course is that if it's not it's rendered void and ineffective. Um, that, those challenges have picked up on other cases for schemes of arrangement, particularly instant cash loans limited, a decision of Zaccaroli J in 2019, uh, where he concluded that compelling a surrender of a lease within a scheme of arrangement wasn't permissible because that was interfering with proprietary rights and took it outside of the scope of an arrangement. Uh, in that case, interestingly, he pointed out that for that issue, he could see no great distinction between scheme of arrangements and CVAs. So what is, um, it seems to me, likely to start happening, uh, and indeed has already started happening, is that the nature of challenges made to CVAs, particularly retail CVAs, is likely to alter. Um, it will extend into attacking the underlying basis of the arrangement and indeed whether it's an arrangement at all. I'll give you a very quick example to finish. There is a, uh, There are challenges in which um, arguments have been advanced by landlords that because unsecured creditors are treated differently within a CVA, which we know is permissible, they cannot vote as one body because they have conflicts of interest. So those creditors that are unaffected, those that are severely impacted, can't vote together. If they can't vote together, any votes they cast in favour of a CVA are not binding and therefore the CVA falls away. Uh, these challenges are obviously concerning for companies, um, apart from anything else, as well as extending the scope, of course, these are challenges that go to the heart of the CVA. They don't have to be brought under Section 6 because they're not under the statutory provisions, so they're not necessarily time limited to the 28-day limit. Those challenges could be raised at any point, which is something to think about going forward. Um, can I now hand over to Kate to deal with the developments uh, in CVAs in the last 12 months or so? Thanks, Matt. 
Um, you do yourself down in your introduction. You're most definitely still a heavyweight, despite your recent exercise regime. Um, if yes, as Matt says, I'm going to um, have a look at the recent changes we've seen this year in 2020. Um, just four changes that I'm going to look at. And as Matt said, if there's any um, questions arising, pop them in the Q&A box. Um, it is, I think, beyond me to uh, watch the Q&A box at the same time as talking to you, uh, despite being uh, supposedly able to multitask as a woman. Um, so what we'll do is we will um, get all of our points out of the way first and then we'll come back to questions at the end. But if there's anything you want to comment or question, do pop it in the Q&A box. So changes in the last um, year, what have we seen in 2020? Four things I'm going to um, very briefly look at for about 15 minutes. Guarantor claims, turnover based rent, fighting fund, and um, finally the Rhino Enterprises case, which is where we'll spend most of our time. Um, so just very briefly, guarantor claims, um, but it's a very small point. Essentially, um, there have been some CBAs we've seen uh, where we've seen landlords lose their claims against guarantors because the company has said, well, hang on, a group company, a parental guarantor or something like that, um, has provided the landlord with a guarantor and as part of the CBA process, we want to take that away. Um, the justification for it is that uh, it prevents ricochet claims, uh, which might impact upon the company that's in CVA itself, and hence causing a failure of the CVA. So that's the justification. And I, I think, in fact, that, that was part of the pound structure CVA, where votes in favour were in the 90s, so it doesn't seem to have had an effect. Next, turnover-based rent. Um, so not only have retail-based rents been reduced um, on a contractual basis, we've also seen a common feature of many recent CBAs be this move towards turnover based rent, um, particularly retail and casual dining. Now, of course, it's attractive to the tenant, you share the risk, you share the reward, um, but we have to remember the fairness test in a CBA. And so compromised landlords are typically being offered something in return, like um, enhanced break rights, if the compromise doesn't seem to be working for them as it beds in, or um, a guaranteed minimum base rent, Sometimes a mixture of the two, you might get a CVA where 80% of the rent is at a guaranteed minimum, 20% is on turnover. Um, and just something to watch out for there, if you do act for a landlord, is how online sales are going to be attributed to each store when there's this turnover based rent. Um, I'm told that technology is sufficient these days for to be able to attribute online sales across many different stores, but definitely something worth looking into. Um, so this is an idea that's it's coming in more and more. I think we first started to see it. It's, it's not purely pandemic based. Uh, I believe the paper chase CVA in 2018 had turnover based rent. So it was something that was coming in, but certainly the pandemic has really kicked it off. Um, we've seen CVAs such as All Saints and New Look move to nearly all turnover based rent. Um, and Matt tells me, and, and Google reliably confirms, that apparently turnover-based rent is something that's been working in parts of continental Europe for years. So um, maybe it is something that we're about to take, take from Europe and adopt here, but let's see how much that continues past the pandemic. Because of course, at the moment, landlords may feel they've got very little other option. So they may um, think, well, turnover-based rent's better than nothing, but, um, of course that could change very quickly and so we need to remember that you can't rely on that but what i have actually heard just finishing that off is that some landlords are getting ahead of the curve and offering turnover based rent before we actually uh, before the company actually proposes a cba um, i've heard that crown estate for example are doing that i i don't know how true that is but um it's interesting that it seems to be being adopted as such a practical and such a uh, common purpose of it or part of a CVA that some landlords are even considering it early. So next, fighting fund for supervisors. We are seeing more and more CVAs with a fighting fund in them, large fighting funds, maybe up to the extent of million pounds. And of course, this makes sense because um, we get CVAs that, that fail um, because a contributing factor might be that um, the challenges that have been advanced, the cost of the company, so much money, so much money has been spent by the supervisors in fighting challenges that the CVA ultimately failed. Um, so we are seeing, and indeed Matt was involved in a very big challenge in Regis, 
uh, and ultimately that's still going on now post the CBA. So um, fighting fund is certainly something we're seeing more and more. But the way it's often worded is that if the fighting fund is not needed, is if there are no challenges, then it will go back to the company. Um, but it seems to us that another good way to word that would be if a fighting fund's not needed, it could go back into the pot. And um, if it goes back into the pot, that's an incentive for creditors not to challenge. So that seems to be certainly something that can and should, maybe should be being proposed. But the only thing we need to be careful about there is something Matt was just talking about. Matt was talking about the um, situation in which if the challenge is whether the CBA is a true arrangement at all, uh, and if indeed it's not a true arrangement, then you wouldn't be bound by, by the Act and by the, the strict time limits within which to bring a challenge. So if you need a fighting fund for that kind of challenge, how long do you need to hold it? The whole period of the CBA, some challenges go on longer, um, and then it begins to lose its incentive for creditors, really. So for the next 10 minutes, I'm just going to look at the Rhino Enterprises case. Now, many of you have probably heard about this case in September, and um, it's been the, the first case to look really at the juris jurisdictional scope of CBAs that include a release clause. And the key question there um, was um, whether the so whether a CBA is a contract for the purposes of the Contract Rights of Third Parties Act. Because of course, if you've got a release clause in it um, that somebody outside the CBA wants to rely upon, you'd need it to be a contract for you to be able to rely on that and you have your third party rights. So the facts were quite distinct in um, Rhino Enterprises, but obviously the question whether a CBA is a contract is of much more, um, much broader application. So it is useful to us on much wider, uh, in a much wider range of situations. But just very briefly, I'm going to just rattle through the facts of Rhino Enterprises so that you've got them against the background. And then I'll come on to talk about more the, the practical side of it, because as Matt said, you know, our aim is for this to be less of a law lecture and more, more practicalities. Um, so looking first at the facts, the directors got advice, directors of two companies got advice um, from council, leading council on an interest rate swap claim, said 60% chance of success of succeeding. They've got various interest rate swaps from Barclays because Barclays had um, made it a condition of all their lending against their property portfolio. Companies then send a letter to Barclays saying, here's our letter of claim. We assert a right to rescind all these missold swaps. About six weeks later, they rescind the swaps. Barclays say, no, 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 uh, we reject those swap claims. We've served default notices now. Um, you owe us 20.9 million for all the sums we have secured against your property and, and for the swaps. Um, next day, Barclays appoint administrators as their qualifying floating charge holders. So war between Barclays and um, the directors is really hotting up now. The administrators come in and um, they have the 60% success advice from leading council, but they also take advice from their own solicitors who say, think it's just less than 50%. So they either can't or don't get funding to pursue Barclays. Barclays not pursued and therefore their claim for over 20 million is accepted. Administrators then sell all the company property in order to pay back Barclays. And there's a shortfall of about 663 odd thousand. The directors managed to then persuade the creditors including Barclays on, on the basis they're gonna get their shortfall paid back to exit the administration by way of a CBA. So Barclays get their shortfall back, go in, the company enters CBA and the directors can then bring their swaps claims. Joint administrators draft the CBA and they pop in a clause saying, we are released from liability if anything that we did during the course of our uh, term of office when we were administrators. Directors go on, bring their swaps claim against Barclays, settle it the following year, I believe, confidential terms, we don't know what they were, but the directors then bring proceedings against the joint administrators for misfeasance and breach of fiduciary duty, saying you should have bought that claim against Barclays, and had you done so, the company liabilities would have been extinguished or reduced to such a level that we could have refinanced. So therefore, we want 18 million from you in compensation for these companies. Joint administrators uh, rely on the clause in the CBA and say, ah, oh, hang on, we got our release from anything we did as administrators. And the directors say, no, 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 you can't rely on that. You're not a party to the CBA. You're an outsider. Um, and CBA is not a contract, so you can't rely on the Contract Rights of Third Parties Act. So, whistle-stop tour of the facts. 
let's look at the more interesting point. Is the CBA a contract and what does this mean for us in our everyday practices? A um, few points the court noted. The joint administrators were not creditors, they're debtors or contingent debtors because a claim has been notified against them. And uh, that means that they are outside of the compromise, which a CBA is between company and its creditors. Court did not accept that CBA was a contract and did not accept contract rights of third parties act would apply or that um, the uh, joint administrators could rely on the release clause. So um, the important point to note here is this is a permission application. So it's summary. So the, the court did not accept that, but it hasn't accepted it on a summary basis because um, of course the joint, uh, the directors need permission to bring a claim against the joint administrators. So all they're asking for at this stage is permission. And um, it was enough for the permission application for the court to simply say, Mm, I think your CBA not being a contract argument is at least realistically arguable and is likely to result in a benefit for the estate. That would have been enough, but the court went further and said, um, I think it's a compelling argument. I think that the submissions for the joint administrators are wholly, um, I, I'm wholly unconvinced by them. Uh, the court said, I'm not finally deciding the point because I've been cited loads of authority on CBA, but not under contract law. And anyway, these are deep waters and uh, there's, there's authority that I should be very careful on treading into new areas of law on a summary basis. Um, and also this was of course a decision of his honor Judge Barker who was about to retire. So um, it is perhaps no wonder that he um, thought uh, I'm not going to tread into these waters on a summary basis at this time. But the court did hold that in my provisional view, it's at least strongly arguable, and I think probably correct, that at most CVAs are a form of quasi-contract, which for some purposes seemingly or apparently treated as if contracts, but in fact, in all cases, not actual contracts. Um, the reasons, all the legal reasons for the court's decision are um, detailed at paragraph 73 to 82 of the judgment, if you need them. They're there. I'm not going to go through the legal reasons, but they're what you would expect. It's an arrangement. It's a creature of statute, etc. It's not a contract. It binds those who dissent. You might think, well, what about an estoppel point? Surely here there must be an estoppel point. Um, but what the court said was um, the directors bring this challenge against the administrators as contributors and they voted in favour of the CBA as creditors. And therefore, you've got your different hats on and you're not a stopped from bringing a claim as a contributory because of the way you acted as a creditor. Even so, when the company is the one who's due to get the benefit from this claim. Um, and of course, the company was a party. So if CBAs are not a contract, which is what this looks like, um, where it looks like we're heading on this final decision, where does that leave us? Well, the, things, the practical things we need to worry about are um, personal liability for supervisors, if you can't rely on the no liability provisions that we regularly see in CVAs, you have no liability provisions for supervisors, their firm, their staff, etc. Um, in connection with preparation and implementation of CVA. What about remuneration? Because indemnities for remuneration are in the CVA itself. What about your fighting fund? Because your indemnity for your fighting fund is in the CVA itself. And what about any guarantor releases? Gar guarantors can't rely on them if they're not a contract. So this could have wide reaching implications, um, which leads me really to what can you do? What can you do in the circumstances if you're um, on the other end of this? Now, um, it might be that we have situations where we have to have a separate agreement alongside the CVA. So if you need any release, think about a deed of release. Um, always think about a nominee agreement. At the stage a CBA is proposed, then think about entering into a nominee agreement by way of deed, which confers rights on the potential supervisors. Um, and also something we were discussing is holding the fighting fund in escrow. So you could potentially hold the fighting fund in escrow between the company and the office holder without um, it actually, despite the fact that the office holder can't necessarily go through the CBA. And also, so, and a point I just want to make here as well is, remember um, that uh, there was, you can probably still use a form of estoppel. So though estoppel wasn't favoured in the Rhino Enterprises case, obviously the facts of that were quite different because the company moved from administration to CVA. So the administrators were in control of the company at the point the CVA was proposed. Um, whereas what we have to really think about is would a court really permit a landlord to bring a claim against the guarantor if they had agreed not to in the CVA? 
um, and they're a party to the CVA, or, or equally would a company um, be stopped for refusing to pay a supervisor's fees, supervisor's remuneration, refusing to repay costs that have been incurred in defending a challenge if the company had agreed to in the CVA. Um, so slightly different here because if you've got an ordinary CVA, you've got a um, land, you, you've got a company moving into CVA which is proposed by the directors. So the connection there is far closer than it was in the Rhino Enterprises case, and it's certainly worth running an estoppel point. But what we will just have to wait and see is how the courts treat that and how the courts deal with that, um, because that's obviously all developing and we're yet to see how they've taken a estoppel point in another case. Um, finally, Matt and I are going to look very briefly at the future of CBAs um, today. Where does this all leave us? Um, the only point I really am going to make on this is that don't forget we've now got the SEGA restructuring plan, which has some key advantages, um, has advantages over schemes, uh, traditional schemes, like the cross-class cram-down. Um, unlike a CBA, it's not necessary to invite all creditors to vote on the proposal, so less vulnerable to challenge on the horizontal basis. Um, and you can compromise rights of secure creditors. And indeed, you've got your third party rights in a scheme, so you can get a release in a scheme, although um, those releases are akin uh, are those that are needed so as not to undermine the purpose of the scheme and um, therefore it's slightly different kind of release but always remember if you've got a CBA where the particular release is um, for example for implementing it and so it's to not undermine the purpose then your argument may be more akin to a scheme there. Um, but for all of those reasons we do pose the question will the restructuring plan take over but looking at 2020 and the way it's gone, I mean, actually, it's probably likely that um, CVAs are returning to popularity um, they were originally for small companies. And now it seems that all the big boys are using them and they're more popular than ever. So I'm going to hand over to Matt now. Um, he's going to finish looking at uh, the future of CVAs in the current economic climate um, and mop up any questions. Um, so I'm going to um, disappear now and leave it to Matt and run off to a court hearing but um, I thank you all for attending from my part anyway. Thanks Kate. Um, yeah as Kate said I just want to pick up very briefly last minute or so what's the future for CVAs? Um, we might have thought that the economic climate we find ourselves in might have changed the approach of landlords to CVAs indeed may have changed the accessibility of CVAs or the appropriateness of CVAs. I'm not sure it does. I, I think um, for, for reasons that are not entirely clear to me yet, CVAs are more popular than ever, it seems to me, and the landlord's approach to them is just as negative as it's been for a long time. Um, and that picks up on a, a question we've had from Philippa about um, CVAs being written in on the basis that properties are simply handed back to landlords. Um, and the question is, do I think that can be overturned? Do I think landlords will grudgingly accept it? Um, well, the answer is, will landlords accept it? Depends on their attitude. At the moment, there's no indication from the challenges that are still being made in the, in the last couple of weeks to existing CBAs that landlords are taking any different view to CBAs and they will continue to challenge them as, in their eyes, being fundamentally unfair. Now, um, can you hand back sites in a CVA? Well, the instant loans decision of Zaccaroli says, no, you can't. You're essentially forcing a surrender on a landlord, which is not a permissible um, compromise within a CVA or a scheme of arrangement. Will landlords accept it? I suppose it all depends on the site in question, but a lot of landlords will take the view, I suspect, that they don't want the site back with the inherent liabilities once they're in possession. And also they compare it to what would happen in an administration, a trading administration, where they'd receive full rent as an expense, certainly whilst the company is trying to sell its business and assets. So you may find that that isn't uh, where this is going. Um, where's the future of CBAs? I'm not sure. R3 have created their own standard form to assist small businesses uh, and medium sized enterprises but they don't seem uh, to be likely to reduce in number. And if anything, I suspect the challenges are going to continue unless and until something more uh, compatible for retail businesses is created. 
but the restructuring under SEGA may not be appropriate for smaller enterprises and may not actually be what's desired in any event. So uh, watch this space, but I can't see uh, CVAs and their challenges becoming a quieter period for any time soon. Um, well, look, that's, um, I hope, helpful um, for those of you that have stayed with us. Can I just say I'm very grateful to you for joining this breakout. Thank you very much uh, for listening to us. Um, that now concludes the uh, Radcliffe Chambers Insolvency Conference day one. Um, we hope you've enjoyed it. We hope you found bits of it useful, helpful, informative, etc. And we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow morning for day two.